Uh, I want to thank our members for inviting me to this talk. Uh, uh, this workshop. Uh, my talk is mostly going to focus on neuroinformatics. So basically, what I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, we are work on mining uh, collision of connectivity database. Uh, this was work. This was work in Germany. With some uh, database in Germany where they collected um, uh, connectivity information, data study information from. A bunch of papers and uh, made it available online for everybody. Uh, so that's going to be the first part of my talk. I'm going to talk about the analysis of networks, the network that they spawn after we mine the data. A uh, um, lot of the work that we do in IBM is, uh, is uh, unlike the beautiful work that was pres presented earlier today and yesterday, is on high level models. We don't, we do not do biologically very detailed models or very realistic models. We are more into phenomenological models. And uh, the reason that IBM is basically interested in this, uh, to sort of uh, give a background, is uh, uh, it started by the, the, the fact that we have this large computer, the two G, and we were interested in finding out what uh, what all can we do with it. Uh, what kind of simulation that could be run? What kind of uh, what what were the what were the drawbacks of the system? What were the changes that you needed to to in, in some sense mimic uh, or model the pain? Not not really uh, not really uh, get down to the uh, cognition, but that was the first part of what our of what our efforts were. And there, I, I think uh, the efforts mainly were on, uh, as I said, on on uh, point models or phenomenological models rather and on large scale where where the testing of how well do G in a supercomputer did in, in, in uh, air, uh, scale increase uh, uh, what were the of the press. Uh, over the years uh, uh, cognitive computing has sort of, from their large scale simulations we reward uh, there were been uh, uh, the, in about four years back DARPA, the US agency, got interested and primarily got interested in it because of uh, the belief that the brain is a very efficient uh, space and power efficient device. Right? So they got interested in finding out what were the, what were the key elements that you could uh, derive uh, from whatever you knew right now, as a fact. What were the key elements that you could derive so that you could maybe, maybe uh, fabricate those chips, maybe, uh, uh, maybe design and fabricate part and space efficient chips, which could do some cognitive tasks, do some tasks which are more, uh, more uh, suitable for uh, non modern computing. Uh, computing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, that's going to be the uh, last part of my work. So to start, uh, so there have been multiple views of the brain. I'm, I'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with this. Uh, I think the chronological order is more what is in the middle. You have this sort of uh, uh, local connectivity networks which came out, which were mapped in things like 2004, 2007, these protein network, uh, protein folds and proteins to sort of uh, 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 which could map the connection between neurons. Swing, uh, uh, Sebastian Swing and Tank also came out with, and they have uh, worked on uh, connectomes for the past few years. In fact, Sebastian Swing has a team of the book on it uh, that came out last year. And uh, uh, you have the DTI networks, which have become popular in the last, uh, uh, again in the last couple of years. So you have the DTI, uh, what is the DTI data, and then some kind of a, uh, uh, model of DTI data where you have the areas. That so this, was, this, this has been sort of a, uh, and before this has been the trace of studies, right? Which I believe was started abroad in the 1900s, so early 1900s. Uh, so there's been a lot of different views of the brain, uh, but one, cons like in some sense, or at least, uh, 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 one largest connection which has been available publicly for everything to use has been Copermine. Was basically based on this study, uh, and uh, 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 I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. So, let's skip over. Coco Mike was basically started by Cotter and uh, uh, or basically the, the, the citation is Cotter and Class in 2000. 
Uh, it's 430 different literature reports. Uh, basically, in these 430 literature reports, 7,000 uh, 7, odd brain sites have been, uh, have been injected with tracers. Uh, I'll talk about what are mapping details. So there have been uh, 2,500 uh, tracer injections, different tracer injections, I guess. I, I don't know if I'm sort of confused about the two different numbers. But, uh, uh, and there have been about 40,000 odd connection details. Now, Cocomite basically, from what, uh, from, uh, is, uh, is basically does this, uh, uh, did this that they look at each literature study and they look at what were the red, what were the base sites that tracer, tracer uh, uh, was injected into, whether it flowed to the target sites, uh, uh, source site, target site. And uh, then between two different literature reports, they also pointed a mapping. So they, if they studied, if one literature study was studying some region here, the other literature study was studying another, uh, another, another uh, rail site. They found out they claimed a mapping between those, uh, 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 those two great sites. So uh, let me give you a detail about it. Uh, let me give you an example. So for example, the first thing is that uh, the data, is, uh, the brain sites are identified by the authors, the year and the brain region. So for example, uh, the Beeman area study by Feldman and Madison in 1991 will be labeled FB91 V1. Uh, uh, while the area of 70 study by Broadman in 1909 will be labeled by B097 uh, and so on and so forth. So every brain site that has been studied in these 430 literature reports has been labeled according to the author who studied it, the year that was studied. And some, uh, whatever, whatever nomenclature they used to, uh, to describe the site, right? So if Broadman used area 70, they used area 70, and then Broadman and West Madison used V1, they used V1. Now obviously the, the first question here, uh, the, the, okay, let, let's just talk about what was there. Uh, the second thing, that, the thing that Coco Mike did was they developed a mapping relationship, right? So there are three types of mapping relationship, one was identical, four types, super area, sub area, and overlapping. So each brain area, uh, uh, so they, uh, give an example, each brain area, a brain area like Feldman, uh, Vanus's V1, was considered to be identical to Broadman's Area 70. So this was a mapping relationship that Coco Mac decided. And similarly, they decided that Feldman's V1 is a sub-area of the Oxford law. So they went in, uh, some of this is based on the literature report itself, the, the, the description of the literature report, maybe the relationship that are reported in the literature report, some of it is based on, on their own judgment. But this is how the, uh, the mapping relationships uh, came about. The, the reason why you need a mapping relationship will become clear uh, in the next slide. Um, the third database that they had was what is called the connectivity, the actual tracing study database, right? So, and the connectivity database was basically the source brain site where the uh, tracer study tracer was injected, the target brain site where the tracer work came from, sort of flowed to. And some kind of a notion of strength, some kind of dominant information, but that, that there was a little bit more, but we are sort of ignoring that now. So, for example, they would say that uh, they, uh, there's, there's a tracer study that says in, in the paper, uh, I, I don't know who the author was, in 2002, there's a paper which reported a projection between V1 and V2. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and there's another paper which is basically uh, reporting a connection between area 1 and uh, area. 46 uh, from the world. Now, these are the three main uh, data sets that we extracted from from Pokemon. Before I go further, basically, let's just, uh, I, I want to sort of, uh, um, the, 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 the one way to think about this database, uh, entire database, of it, is to think about it as a mapping of the world kind of a thing. So you have, you have brain sites, which could you could think of them as as countries, and you could have you could have you could have those at country level, at the state level, at the city level, or continent level, or at any level, depending on the resolution of where where, where you're going to line. Uh, then you have basically different people who are drawn in atlas, right? So you have you have an atlas which is drawn in 1909, you have an atlas which is drawn in 2002. Maybe some people drew an atlas of only of Australia. Some people drew only an atlas of 
North America. So there are people who have studied different parts of the brain, different parts of the atlas. So that's the, uh, and the Cocomax uh, contribution, is they basically looked at all these different atlases and sort of said, there is a mapping relationship between the two. And the third thing is, uh, is the actual connectivity. So somebody has gone into the atlas, using the atlas, they have said, okay, there is, there exists uh, a train route or a plane route or a, a highway between these two brain sites. So now you have this separate atlases, each of them sort of having a different nomenclature. You want to put them together, and then you want to all these routes that you have, whether they're highway, train, then you want to sort of make sure that they kind of line up and become consistent with the atlas that you're drawing. So, uh, so, so then I'll give you a better example uh, of that in, 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 a, in, this, uh, in this slide. And basically, what this uh, at the top in, in Cocomac, you would there would be a, a connectivity tracer study. Uh, I think that you would see a disjointed, you would see that, okay, there is a forward projection here, there is a backward projection here, but you wouldn't know that they are basically reciprocal if you, if you didn't consider the mapping here. Another way, another example of the same thing is that basically, Cocomite, uh, so when you see the arrow, that's what Cocomite is reporting. So this, is, this part Cocomite reports, this part Cocomite reports, this part Cocomite reports, and this part. So all these arrows is reported. But when you make the bounding box, which is the mapping details, you are basically able to figure out that these two are, these are identical, these are identical, these are identical, and then you are able to find a very nice cycle. It's basically, V1 with visual areas to, um, I, I'm, I'm not a new person, so excuse me, uh, TF and then hippocampus, I guess, and TH and then back into visual uh, area. So unless you are able to do the mapping relationship, unless you are able to sort of put the atlases together, you are not being able to make, merge the paths and make the right paths be able to find out where the paths lie. And look, this whole thing is, is because a lot of people have done their study at a lot of different resolutions and at a lot of different, uh, uh, and in a lot of different ways and use them a long nature which was maybe what they were, maybe their community was studying or I, 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 but a lot of different nomenclature has developed over the years in neuroscience. Now, uh, so we started this work in 2008 and Cocomite has been around for about six or seven years before we, we were this thing. And one of the reasons why not that much work had been done in mining Cocomite was because basically, because of these mapping relationships, there were conflicts. So I'm going to not talk about what the conflicts were and uh, what basically our contribution in mining the Cocomite database came about. So, the contributions, uh, the context could be very simple that in the database itself, there could be one study which was, could be saying that PFCD is a, is a subset of area 9. And there could be another study saying PFCD is equivalent to 9. Right? So, basically, uh, let me just, uh, I'm going to concentrate only on two mapping relationships. One is identical and one is sub, sub area. Right? So, it's, if you think of it as a parcelation, all your concerned about is those which are identical to each other and what, what, what is sub area. So Cocomite would give you, uh, uh, by itself there could be some, this could be because of human error, but this could basically be because different literature people had thought about it in a different way. Right? Uh, the other thing is, so identical, uh, both identity and sub area are transitive relationship, right? A, to, A is identical to B, B is identical to C, so supposedly you should say A is identical to C. Now, so that transitory also will create a problem. So if somebody says PCI is identical to ITL, is identical to PF hash one, is identical to 7P, but there's another literature report is basically which is saying that PSCI is, uh, is a subset of 7P, right? So that's, that's kind of a conflict right there. The conflict that arises even transition between them. Right? So these are, these are simple con uh, uh, <coughs> conflicts to deal with, and there are more conflicts to deal with right here, transitory conflicts. Similarly, there, there could be a bunch of them. Even out here, basically, you can't, I, I don't know how well you see it. Transitive T will give you these blue blue spots, and everything that is underlined will give you a uh, closure. So, uh, will, will give you a conflict. Uh, so, basically, when we were mining this database, we found that there was a lot, there were there's some simple conflicts, and simple conflict, but a lot of transitive conflicts. And Stefan and Cotter knew about them because they, when they published the original paper, they had talked about it. Uh, that we uh, came up with. 
it is it, by, by, by the very nature of like when of establishing it, it is difficult to find a transitive complex like when you're setting up it like this, right? Especially the way, way they when they're looking at different literature reports, it's not that they can sort of look ahead so much and say, okay, this this relationship might not occur later. Right? So uh, it, it, it is a difficult task and uh, 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 for both from this way of uh, putting in the data and for cleaning it up and down, uh, whichever way you look at it. So basically the biggest uh, contribution that we have is uh, 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 in, in mining the database and the biggest step that we came up with was something which was based uh, uh, on what is basically called transitive closure. If you take a set, uh, especially if it has a transitive relationship, you basically find a closure. But closure meaning there's nothing outside. If you're saying A, B, C, the example that I gave, A is equivalent to B, B is equivalent to C, then A and all three will belong to the set. That will be the transitive closure, right? So there's nothing outside of the set. Uh, which is not, which cannot be reached by a transitive relationship within the set, right? Ah, sorry. So the idea was very simple. So uh, think of I as the original set uh, of identical relationships. L as the L as the original set of uh, uh, of subset relationship. You find the transitive closure of I. You find the transitive closure of L, right? So L plus and I plus are the transitive closures. And the transitive closures are very simple to do in, in, in if you have a matrix, it's basically part of the matrix, uh, removing the diagrams every time that you take the part of the matrix. Uh, the conflict that you're looking at basically the intersection of I plus and L plus, basically wherever you're coming up with the, this, this is the ones that are all the conflicts that are there at the data set. Right? And the, these conflicts exist and so what and uh, now the question becomes what is more important for you, I or L, on one of the judgment calls. You know, so in our case, we basically said I is the more important relationship. So uh, we started with a set J, and we said, let's start with this, I haven't drawn it very well, but let's just start with a small set J and keep sort of uh, increasing it till whatever maximum we can increase, so that J plus never intersects L plus. Right? So then you can't have one. You are trying to find a big set of identical relationships which do not lead to problems. This is the main insight, the main uh, this thing that we came up with uh, when we were doing uh, the mining, and this was the reason that we were able to get a lot of data uh, from uh, out from Token Bank uh, as compared to what had been taken out previously. So, what did it lead to basically? Uh, what it led to, uh, I'm going to give you, uh, so, uh, this is the, well, the first of the postulation scheme or the map that, or the atlas that we sort of speak. So we came up with one universal, one map, instead of so many different atlases, there was one map, so where, where the resolution, the, the, the highest resolution, so the hierarchical map, there's a brain, there's a cortex which is divided into these lobes. All these acronyms that you see are basically consistent with whatever they are in the copper mine. So all our acronyms are that sense, you can go back, take a, uh, uh, if you look at the paper, you can basically look at, uh, uh, so for example, you can query a poker mine on CTA hash 2 and you can find out all the information. So that way it is consistent with whatever it is in poker mine. Uh, so brain is cortex, basal ganglia and diacephalon, cortex is divided into these different lobes. Uh, example of further division is occipital lobe is divided into B2, B1, and then back and OA. And so this is basically based on the J, J plus and M plus, whatever relationships uh, that we can come up with, right? So each of these areas, uh, from 7,000, each of these areas would have other areas which are identical to it, merged into it. Right? So if, if B1 is identical to 17, all 17 connect, uh, all, all, if B1 would be most probably identical to 17 and some other uh, areas of so all connections which are reported for 17 or other areas will be merged into V1. So each of these areas had other areas which are equivalent to it, merged into it. And then they were sort of established in this hierarchy using the L relationship. Uh, this was a temporal lobe. Basically, again, uh, uh, some uh, the hierarchy uh, arrangement, they had thalamus. And this was the entire hierarchy, right? So we came up with this radial tree layout. 
and you have to drain the cortex, you have the uh, uh, lobes, you have the further subdivision. Now, uh, this is a question, uh, actually I shall come to that question a little later. Uh, so, you know, the, the good thing about it is not, uh, you, you see that it's the entire brain, you have the thalamus, you have the frontal lobe, in the basic area, it's not just the cortex, the other parts of the brain also. Uh, and, there's, and there's one one parcellation. Instead of having multiple parcellation, multiple disjoint parcellation, or overlapping parcellation, there's just one parcellation. It could be argued that this might not be the best parcellation. There could, there could be other different parcellations. So be it. There could be, but this is the way we, this is the uh, one that we came up uh, was most consistent with the methodology that we used. Now, the last, I'm talking about the address of the parcellation. Then. Obviously, the most important thing is not the parcellation, the actual connectivity, the projection. Right? So, uh, on this parcellation, you know, basically when you draw one projection, it's, I guess it's the projection will be V1 and L here. So that's one. So basically, between each node in this parcellation, in this parcellation, there could be a connection. Right? Obviously, connect, the, the, the nodes which are internal should not have uh, uh, should not have connections. But unfortunately, there will be nodes which are will have partial connections because somebody might have studied uh, an area at a high resolution, somebody later on might have studied the same area at a much lower resolution. We have not decided to remove those connections uh, because of lack of knowledge. So we have reported all connections. So there were, uh, this is, if you draw a line with representing a connection, this is one connection. Uh, there are 6,600 connections. Uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty, but visually is a dead stuff. But you could do bundling and you could draw it in the inter in a smart way and you could come up with this nice diagram, uh, which is basically all the 6,600 connections kind of bundled together in different, different okay. This is not the same bundling uh, used in the brain, or this is just visual bundling. Based on the hierarchy, you kind of use that as uh, for supplying to bundle the data. How does this whole thing compare with whatever was available? So whatever was available was, uh, as far as we knew, publicly available was these data sets at the time that we uh, came up with. And basically, our goal was a jump, uh, substantial jump ahead. Right? So we have many more, many more areas and uh, many more connections between areas. And to put it visually, basically, Kaiser and Hilgit, Hilgit and who had basically, who had, uh, who had uh, a mind for the mind also, this was their data. Basically, one of the things is that they were not studying, they were studying in the cortex. They were not uh, studying other, but this was the other best known publicly available data set at that point of time as compared to this one, which definitely full of. Now, one of the things, uh, I, we, we sort of have kind of uh, the stress upon this point. We are comprehensive in that we, we have not discarded any study in global mind. We, we, we are, so my background, our background is computer scientists, both the papers, of course, people who wrote this paper. We have no knowledge of computer science, so we have no intentions of making any call on what should be included and what should not be included. So whatever was there in global mind was included in the data. Uh, we can, you can trace back every connection. So if you look at the paper, there is a very clear uh, way that there's all the data is given in a fair way that you could sort of query the connection and take it back to Kokomai and see where it came from, which radiation reports to this portal. It is concise because we started with, uh, I think this is a, a 7,000 odd air, air, air brain size you were, which were merged together, which were identical to 300 odd brain size. Right? And there's a one parcellation of one atlas, and colossal is just our selling point. We like to say that it's large. But it, uh, uh, this, so based on uh, based on uh, so this was the mining part of it. Uh, 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 the mining part, the chief algorithm was the transitive closure and how to basically save, uh, how to ensure that you could use transitive closure to avoid conflicts. The second part, now that you had the network. Uh, this network. So basically, you had 383 sites, and you had a connection with some of those sites. 6,000 sites, 600 connections. So you had a network, right? Of an edge. This is just the presence of a projection. It does not talk about strength. It does not talk about the laminar. Many other things. It's a very high level. Just say that there, in some study in Kokomai, 
they both stated the study where the projection from area A to projection from area B. So we basically analyzed that network, and uh, 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 these are these are these are favorite uh, network theoretic methods to analyze uh, this thing. So uh, two of them start basically the diameter and the characteristic path. Uh, three are basically related to uh, what what is called the Swan World model, right? So basically. The fact is that you could have a large, long diameter, which is the shortest path length, but then you could know, uh, 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 you could, you could, uh, you could have, what, what else? Uh, you could have a, you, you, the two things that you require is a, is a high clustering coefficient and uh, uh, reasonably high diameter. That's the part that the, the, uh, the uh, 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 Small one uh, effect, right? So it's getting uh, uh, as compared to a random, uh, random network. The other thing that is there is that the question this is a directed network where uh, there are, there's a direction between the source side and the target side where, where, where the trace of flows from. 42% um, of the connection are, are, are reported to be this thing. Again, there could be issues about whether there is what kind of directionality is there, whether some areas are not be studied enough, whether certain projections have not be studied enough, but this is what the data reports. Uh, this is a famous, uh, uh, Warren Beaver was a, was a philosopher, scientist, and uh, I, I guess he was a dabbled with a lot more uh, in, in computer science. And he came up with this concept of organized complexity of modules, of modulus, and basically, the organized complexity is a very simple model where it says, take a system, if you can divide it up into modules, uh, it's great, right? Because, you know, breaking up things is great. But now if the modules are very well interacting a lot among themselves, then what does it mean? So there's, his whole point was that when you look at the, say, when you organize them in, in this kind of matrix form, if the off diagonal, diagonal element, which basically represents the intra-module uh, interaction, is also high. What does it mean? That's the concept of organized complexity. And organized, the, the, he, he came up with this term of organized complexity. That this organized complexity is good because these modular systems can be then simulated well using computer systems. That, 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 that was the point of uh, uh, we So here you find that all, if you look at all, all that off diagonal elements, most of them are pretty well. There's a lot of connection with that on the uh, frontal lobe. Uh, temporal lobe to basal ganglia, uh, I guess that's also frontal lobe to temporal lobe. So, though they are modular systems in the sense that you can say there's, there's, a, there's a temporal lobe, there's a frontal lobe, but these, each of them are interacting a lot with the other, uh, with the other, uh, with the other lobes also. Uh, and the, 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 the other results which so network theory, the, the, the other big result that has come out. The, the two, two uh, basic network theory has two major results in the past 20, 25 years, I guess, 20 years, uh, small world effect and, uh, and uh, scale free graphs. And scale free graphs are very popular because everybody says uh, if you draw the degree distribution, the degree is the number of edges that come up per area, and you draw it in a log log scale, everything will it'll be a straight line. And, uh, uh, scale free, uh, Barabasi made them popular by saying that scale free networks come about because of preferential attachments, right? So the preferential attachment for anybody, uh, for everybody who's on Facebook and all that, basically there's no so many. If you're, if you're popular, you can get more and more edges or more and more friends very easily, right? So in, in social network, that makes a lot of sense, that you can, you can get more and more popular. It's also called the Moderna effect, it's called the various names. Right. So, preferential attachment leads to scale free graphs where the degree distribution falls in a certain way. Uh, unfortunately, and it has been hypothesized the brain was scale free. Right. People wanted to say that it was scale free. Uh, C elegance uh, has been shown to be non scale free, but uh, uh, they were hoping the primate brain was uh, scale free. There was, there was no data on it. So, when we drew our degree distribution, it came out to be non scale free. On the other hand, when you do it on the semi log scale, it works in the straight lines. So it's exponential degree distribution. Which makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Uh, 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 see, scale free or preferential attachment is very easy in a Facebook kind of environment because there's no cost of adding a friend. 
you can have as many friends as you want. Uh, and the moment you have a cost where you cannot sort of add friends or add edges or add, uh, become, uh, yeah, add friends in that or uh, adjacent neighbors, uh, you will not have scale pickups. And you would uh, have exponential where you basically have a tail. So that's, this is more consistent with the fact that in the brain you can't sort of keep adding it and keep adding uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, so this was one, one, uh, one uh, result that we came up with, we saw, which is also consist consistent with the CLM's that uh, came out many years ago. Uh, another example of, of network mining, which uh, I, I, I Basically, that what they, what happens is that people look at how nodes are important. Right? So, what is the concept of node being important? It could be very simply degree. How many edges do I have? How many friends do I have? Or it could be as complicated, and I think this is the example I like to take as uh, as uh, page rank. Page rank, uh, I, I, I think uh, some of you will. Page rank is the algorithm which Google uses to give you service results. And basically, the way page rank works is that uh, a page is important if it is linked by important pages. It's just not important because there are lots of people linked to it, right? Other important people. So it's kind of an iterative definition. You are as important as your friends uh, in a social network kind of scenario. So, uh, and between us is a, is a concept, a shortest path. These, these are all very similar concepts in the sense they all look at network, look at the paths, the hop distances, or if they are weights given, they are basically look at the some of the uh, this thing and they try to find out what are the important paths, what are the important edges in the network. And what we uh, want to say, uh, what I want to say about this uh, graph is basically uh, about the state of this that when you when you do a very simple thing, if you get this is just basically saying there's six uh, there are uh, eight ways of, of measuring importance of a node. If you put them and you rank the top ten for each uh, uh, each each, uh, uh, each metric, then in this table, which is uh, ten into eight, eight, eighty eighty entries, most of them are turned out to be from prefrontal cortex. So there's nothing. You just take the structured data, just say, do this simple analysis, and just do the top ten. Quite a few turn out to be. Uh, majority turn out to be prefrontal cortex. So for, for our knowledge, prefrontal cortex is supposed to be sort of central to a lot of different. A uh, lot of tasks in the brain, and structurally also it is really important. Uh, that sort of uh, uh, now continuing along the line, basically we continue to ask, what are the topological important? What is the way to measure? Uh, what is the, uh, what is really just just in a topological analysis uh, of that network? So one of the ideas is that suppose you take a local connection. So, a lot of people, when they, even the previous results, when you people used to talk about important nodes and important what is what is central. Now, if you forget that and you just say, I want to know what is around me. I don't. It doesn't make a difference if I'm important to others or not. I'm just concerned about myself. What role am I playing really? Am I sort of connecting to people? Am I working by myself? Am I doing nothing? Am I just uh, this thing? And here the concept of what we call stars comes about. So if you take a local network and if none of your uh, adjacent neighbors are connected, then it's a star, right? Because they all like think of it as you're the center and there are five or six uh, adjacent nodes. So in that case, if that's true, then you are playing an important role in sort of providing connectivity, communication between, enabling communication between these people. If that's on the other hand, if all the adjacent people are talking among themselves, then you're not providing any any uh, any connectivity, and that's a clique, right? In a clique, in a clique, it's not communication is is easy. Anybody can talk to anybody. There's no real one person with any connection, right? Clique is, in some sense, clique is about competition, stuff is about communication, right? Clique is a different different. Uh, so here, what we are drawing is basically it's very simple for each. Vertex, you are basically saying, just tell me how close am I to a star? Am I doing a lot of work in terms of communication? Am I enabling a lot of communication between people? If you are at this part, then you are doing no work. It's a sort of inverted. This thing, if you are doing at, out here, you are doing a lot of work because a lot of people, you have a large star and you are sort of enabling 
if we resolve to them. So this basically the profile, the reason um, which is I define by interesting about it is it's kind of nearly continuous. So the brain really doesn't sort of optimize a local network. It doesn't seem to. Every local network seems to be uh, it is 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 uh, is, uh, is distinct. As compared to when you look at constructed network, on one less example being an internet network, where there is preference for a certain type of network. They kind of and the reason that there is, there is preference for a certain type of network because in a constructed network like this, constructed and not overly optimized network like internet, uh, basically a copy model is often used. You basically say, okay, this is the best router system out there. This is they have done this did this kind of service for a while. Just let's copy the same router system here and copy its neighbor and it will work well for us and also. So that kind of thing, if you, will, you see a lot in, and there are other networks that you see, constructive networks that you see, this kind of staircase structure, while in the brain you see a more, more, more regular profile. The last thing is that in the brain there are no pure stars, there are cliques in the brain, but there are no pure stars in the sense that there is no one neighborhood where somebody is playing the role of sort of enabling communication. So our conjecture is that basically, you know, it is true that the brain optimizes the violence, but it also may be true that the brain is working and providing connectivity. It doesn't just optimize the violence, it enables connectivity when, it, when, when, when needed. Uh, this is, a, I'm going to go quickly through this one, this is just, this is very recent work that we are doing now. Uh, this is the same graph that you saw earlier. This, the, the, the splines are drawn this way because basically these are the intra low and the intra basal ganglia or the intra dash of uh, thalamus splines. So you see in the thalamus there, there are really not that many intra connections, while in the frontal lobe there are a lot of connections and uh, same way over the temporal lobe. Now the, the thing is that uh, on top of it basically we are saying that there, there, there is a concept, again we are looking at local connectivity, what am I enabling? And in that sense, what you could have, you could have different kind of roles. Uh, this, this has been done way back in social networks. You could be a gatekeeper, where, uh, you could be a coordinator, basically you're allowing two of your fellow group members to talk. That could happen. You could be a representative, uh, where you are, if all the communication is happening from your group is happening through you. You could be a gatekeeper, where all the communication to, to your group is happening through you. And you could be a consultant, which is between two different groups, and you could be a, uh, uh, and a consultant is between, two, uh, you will be a different group, and the other, uh, you, will be, you will sort of act as an external guide on the group, and you, you could be a liaison between two groups. Groups here are basically the groups that we have decided is the groups of thalamus, basal ganglia, the lobes. So there are eight groups in this network. Just a very simple kind of this thing. And based on that, we have finally this, this thing. Uh, we are still to sort of analyze, but we see, we see out here in our hospital a lot of uh, uh, well-defined, uh, well, uh, hospital lobe seems to be very balanced in the kind of structure, uh, roles that it does, while frontal lobe is a lot more coordinated and stuff. This is uh, uh, something that we are digging deeper and, uh, and working on. Uh, so this basically kind of concludes what I want, well, this, this is a kind of network theoretical or network uh, uh, work that we are doing, basically taking the topological network that we mined from Bokamak and they are trying to make different, based on the data, topological analysis of it. What is, what I want to know, what are the roles that you know to take, what are the roles that they have indication, what are the different, uh, what are they really trying to do based on this topology. Obviously there is a lot more, Neuroscience data, right? There's layers, there's trend, there are all those things which we don't have the data for. So, uh, if and as we get that data, we, we can do more about it. Uh, I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking about this. What what really is what really sort of pays for all this? And what what I interest in this. So the reason why I became interested in this is basically of what they call the cognitive computing uh, uh, the thing. Um, this, uh, as I said right in front, this is a, right, uh, this is a, a sponsor by DARPA and has been a project for the past four years. Uh, all, I, all the, I'm sure all of you are familiar with approximately these kind of uh, other things. But basically, they're by processors, we mean the neurons, the interconnection of the synapses, and 
and the writing that is bags on and that. Uh, obviously, there's this amazing capability to do this. And this question of whether we can have computers who can build this, can do this, is a question that we are not the first to ask. Uh, and I'm sure we're not the last to ask. I'm sure there will be more work on this as we go along. Uh, what fascinates IBM in general, uh, or fascinates me in particular also, a lot is the fact basically captured by this, uh, this thing. Uh, basically, you have all these sensors. Right? And there's a lot of data coming, and I'm told there's, there's the neurons in your feet, there's the neurons in your, in your hand, the neurons you have seen something, you have, there's so many people you have here, you have seen, sensing so many different colors, faces, and uh, as you're standing, you're sensing. Uh, Self balancing, that, that you're hearing things, that something happening out there. But still, you're able to still do action. So, there's so much different send data coming in, right? Uh, the most, the best computer that is out there right now cannot basically process this amount of, forget what it does, let's forget the fact that it's cognitive or intelligent or just to, just, it cannot just load that kind of data that is coming in. When we, when we talk about this, uh, uh, I'm sure, given the given the provision, you know, all of you have seen the smart planet uh, advertisement that I've been runs, right? And think about it, we are going to throw out sensors every corner of the world, and that they are going to send out that kind of data. Can, they, can you have, can you really get that data, and can you really do maybe say simple linear regression? No, you can't, because that, that, that volume of data, the throughput of data is too high. But it seems the brain is able to do this. Whether, whether through attention, whether through some selection, whether through whatever we can, it is able to process a reasonably large amount of data, right? And it is able to process it in a, in, in a part uh, 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 which is less than a light bulb and space, uh, the, uh, the uh, space which is less than a little bottle. So this is, uh, this is important because of the fact that, with, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, I forget the number, but Recently, only about uh, last week, there was a number about how much you know, power consumption data center are taking. All of us use Google. Every query that we do, you Google costs a certain amount of power, right? Each data center, nobody releases the number, but somebody estimated the number. Uh, it some, it was, right now, the data centers are the largest consumers of power in the world, uh, outstripping all other. Uh, the magnitude is, is higher than any other industry. It's not aluminum, everybody used to say aluminum, um, uh, aluminum, oh, I forget what it's called, smelting. That's used to be the, uh, the, the number one, but data centers as, 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 a, as, a, as a, this thing have become the number one by a large market. So obviously for all companies, doing part is, uh, is efficient. Space is efficient more because of the fact that if you would put brains on a chip kind of a thing. Uh, uh, this is how it came. Uh, the, basically, the idea was that uh, you know, when they looked at the current devices available uh, and the current uh, the technology available, they said that they, the numbers in just in pure numbers. Again, and, and again, I have to emphasize that this is the thing: uh, the pure numbers and phenological models, not not detailed models, not those kind of things could be implemented in, in silico. This space of these numbers. And this is a, 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 a this is a reason that the project in some sense. Uh, so uh, what the state of the project is that there is a uh, there is what is called a cognitive computing chip. It has two fifty six neurons and uh, uh, so two fifty six into two fifty six synapses. Um, <coughs> it has programmable cyber synapses. Uh, currently it basically plays pong. It doesn't do much more than that, but it, 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 can, it has the ability. Uh, there, 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 there's work going on currently on, uh, on vision. There's work going on navigation and uh, other kind of things. Uh, I, I think that's part. And the reason why we kind of relating it back to Mac is why we studied all this. But basically, the idea was that we take this chip, each chip, each area will become a chip, and we sort of put them together and then see what. What really comes up. We haven't reached that stage yet. Uh, uh, we hope we can do that soon. Uh, how will this be used? 
uh, in the typical scenario is that uh, you, you think of this as a smart planet kind of thing. Some data will be coming in from here. There will be contextual data that you have, and basically there will be feedback, and you will, so there's sensation that is coming in. Uh, there's the various, uh, various examples of this one is the healthcare, where basically you have a lot of different kind of time series data coming, right? So you have, uh, there are two places where one which will make you a lot, both which will make you a lot of money. One is the financial data uh, uh, scenario where there's a lot of time series data coming in, uh, and the other is healthcare. And obviously, the healthcare kind of thing, it helps to have this brain and chip kind of thing because it's small. Uh, so that kind of concludes my talk, I think, yes. Uh, I'll just close it. This, this, this is a quote that uh, actually was in a, in a magazine, but it kind of has captured our, uh, our, uh, our philosophy in cognitive computing, so we like to put it at the end. And I'll ask the question. development in that direction within your frame. Because I think that probably very critical information also for the second part of the talk. Yes, I think, uh, I see the thing, uh, uh, let's to, to put it, currently a lot of IBMs have a lot of things spent in sort of mining the data. Uh, in some sense we are not giving back uh, we are publishing the, 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 the data that we mine is publicly available. Uh, but what you are saying is right. So, for example, uh, when you when you simulate, you need this micro column structure and other uh, That kind of stuff we haven't been able to really. It is quite complex, and we haven't got a good grasp of it yet. So, I think it will become maybe uh, maybe say this project is supposed to last another five years or so. so in that time and a five to ten years, we do expect that we will be able to sort of provide more rich information based on whatever our observation or whatever our experiments were. So this will this will be more like uh, I think the way uh, it is we think right now is this is we took some neuroscience data and we did some simulations of uh, mind that data and now what we give back is to neuroscience that just makes sense kind of a thing and they can then say validate it and come up with maybe better models and maybe they can study it in more details. But it hasn't started happening right now. So IBM was involved or what is involved with the Blue Brain project in the Right. Is that completely unrelated to your effort? Uh, so Blue Brain is a very good example of detailed models, right? But they are really going to details of Right now, I think not involved directly as far as I know. Uh, but uh, they're doing great, uh, they're doing a great job of sort of going right into the neuron the, and the other structures, synapses and uh, neurotransmitters and all. So uh, I think it's sort of their part. And the way we think about it is that they're, they're, they're the microscope and we are sort of a telescope. I don't think they are deep and we are sort of standing out and watching them. They should, should be not to stay. <laughs> uh, so the cliques that you are talking about, are they related anywhere to dynamic code or the Tony Edelman history? So we, we, yeah, so the Tony Edelman's work, we, um, uh, we also found a code. So there's one co code co in the network, which is the directly integrated, which is which has cliques, but it has other, it's, just, it's, it's a code by the sense that if you break it anymore, it will sort of fall and disintegrate. 
and there is no connection. Is this BMC uh, Yeah, it has a bu bunch of areas. So it's, uh, that is there. Um, cliques here, the cliques that I was talking about is basically local cliques. So anything that is uh, within a certain, in a local setting. The question is actually a basic one uh, in the sense that most of the neuroscience uh, computational work involves the hardware of the brain, the spike planes and all kinds of things. Uh, but we also need software. So we need some data representation in the brain and now when you make a com cognitive computing machine, then you need to know uh, what is the uh, mathematical structure that is running the brain. So have, has IBM focused on that also? See, so uh, to be, I think we were having this discussion on uh, what we have, I, I think there is a slide somewhere, but I, I, what we have, what we have taken from neuroscience is a the concept that there are spikes. So you communicate only when you communicate. The processors just don't keep talking to each other. They, they communicate with spikes on the when there's a need for communication, right? You're taking the circuitry, uh, the Skokomai circuitry, all local circuitry kind of thing. It, it's very fascinating, you know, uh, this is a, uh, circuitry, just to give a very short. Uh, people discovered circuitry, or the way circuits should be laid out, independent of what the brain did before, and later on discovered the brain also does that kind of stuff. So there's something called rent through that, that's there, the brain that's there, and the chips, both that. So there's circuitry, there's uh, communication, and then there's a the concept of basically the synapses, the memory or the data being close to the neurons, which is the processor. The data and neurons, uh, data and processing is very close together. Now these are the concepts that have been taken, and this is the, what IBM's cognitive computer uh, basically. Uh, neuroscience in general, or the, the, the thing that you're asking for, has much more to, to discover and to understand we are not there yet we are we are not we are not talking about so basically all we need to know in some ways when you talk about software is how do you translate something into spike in language into spikes just then there was there is more but we have not talked there yet. one last question we are running out yeah from I guess point of view of power consumption and so on is it are you thinking synchronous and scalability of asynchronous circuits and so on, is, is that an issue at all in your design? We tested a few other. Uh, right now at this level that we are, the, the chips, by, uh, the, the one that we have is 256 neurons, uh, 1,028 neurons, those that's fine. But as we go along. Okay, let's thank the speaker.